of a global health crisis from the ongoing nuclear disaster at four of the six nuclear units at Fukushima Daiichi in Japan, where globally unprecedented nuclear releases continue despite ludicrous government and TEPCO insistence that the doomed reactors have achieved what they are cosmetically calling a, quote, cold shutdown, end quote. In a news conference on December 16th, Tokyo Electric Power Company President Toshio Nishizawa called the completion of an untested and desperate crisis a, quote, milestone, quote. But his statement was rendered meaningless by ongoing radioactive releases of uncertain magnitude, probable meltdowns, and documented isotope pollution of local water tables and the entire Pacific Ocean, including its aquatic food chain. Zany plans for an overground tent and subterranean diapers have come to nothing, and even the state of the continuing meltdowns remains unknown. That's why TEPCO is as of today attempting an environmentally obscene colonoscopy of Unit 2. The clueless TEPCO operators are now proposing to use an industrial endoscope to study the insides of the doomed reactor number two in January of 2012 in order to see what only they refuse to acknowledge about reactor pressure and containment escape of molten uranium fuel that at this moment threatens the local water table and whose cooling water is slaking off into the Pacific Ocean en route to North America. We of Five O'Clock Shadow recently discussed these issues with Fairwind's nuclear engineer and former plant operator, Arnie Gunderson. How do you clean up an entire countryside? Uh, there was a 10-mile evacuation. Uh, officials are only slowly and reluctantly uh, admitting the uh, the exponentially larger exposures than they officially have admitted. And uh, those numbers keep growing day by day. Uh, Tokyo, uh, places um, uh, that would not be obvious from dominant wind patterns, have been uh, highly struck with this radioactive debris in the wind, not to mention in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, how bad is it uh, in on both the land and the ocean? Yeah. Well, that, that's a great question. How do you clean up a country? Uh, that's a, um, the, uh, the before I get to there, eighty. Per, they've just discovered that eighty percent of the radiation went into the Pacific. Now that's good because it didn't. If the wind had been blowing the other way, it, it would have destroyed Japan as a nation. Uh, it would have cut Japan in half, north to south. So it was good that the wind blew out to sea for the people of Japan, but it's really not very good for the Pacific Ocean, that's for sure. But how do you do it is, uh, first you have to admit the severity of the problem, and then it's just going to cost a lot of money. Tokyo Electric is saying they're going to clean this thing up for something on the order of 15 billion U.S. I won't talk in yen because they've got a lot more zeros than we do, but uh, something on the order of 15 billion U.S. dollars. And, you know, I used to do decommissioning of power plants for a living. And I think the Fukushima site alone, not the state, but just the site, is going to be something like $50 billion. And then the, the land mass that's most contaminated is probably going to be another $150 billion after that. So we're looking at $200 billion. And um, right now there's a question of who's going to pay for that. It looks like the Japanese government is trying to prop up TEPCO, trying not to force them into bankruptcy. But I think the the right thing to do would be to sell them, to let TEPCO be sold and use the cash, um, because it does have a lot of other assets, uh, use that cash to compensate victims and to clean up. Even when that's done, there will be you know, perhaps another $100 billion that's going to have to come out of... Um, the Japanese government. Arnie, um, because of BP in the Gulf of Mexico, I could no longer eat red snapper. Because of TEPCO in the Pacific, I can no longer enjoy ahi tuna. There's yet another water problem that I, I neglected to mention. I'm understanding that wa that radioactive water has leaked underneath 
the facilities and possibly encroached upon the water table that serves the nearby population. Have you heard anything like that? Uh, yes. The, the, um, by the way, you can. I, I'm advising my friends to eat tuna and salmon this year because it, the, I think the radiation will work its way up the food chain, and by next year it will be uh, uh, something that uh, questionable. But you're right. The the floors cracked during the earthquake. The Fukushima site dropped by 18 inches. The land just dropped 18 inches as a result of the um, the earthquake. That was how severe it is. And when land does that, obviously the foundation cracks. And um, um, groundwater is coming in and radiation is, is going out into the soil. Now, what TEPCO is proposing is they're, they're building a, um, a berm, a dike, on the ocean side to prevent that radiation from moving into the ocean. But they're not building it on the land side. Um, one of the proposals out, and I think part of the reason is they just don't have the money. They are undercapitalized and, and unable to do all the things they should be doing. Um, but um, one of the proposals on the, on the land side of the power plant is to put in wells that will pull that water out of the ground and treat it so that it doesn't continue to move inland. If it grows inland, Robert, I think we're we're looking at, you know, a hundred years where people will not be able to use that groundwater. Our guest is Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. And uh, Arnie, you have, um, with your prodigious work, uh, often made the point that the engineering liability of the design of the Fukushima plant, or some of them, is uh, one that Americans face as a risk every day throughout the country. Can you speak to the uh, design failures or hazards that are still operating every day here? Yeah, we have um, 23 reactors that are identical to Fukushima um, of the 104 that are in the country. So about a little more than 20% of our reactors are identical to Fukushima. And um, I was an expert in uh, a group of citizens petitioned the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to uh, to shut these down, including two engineers, me and uh, a gentleman named Dale Breidenbaugh. Dale left General Electric back in 1976 because he recognized the problems in the um, in the Mark I design. So these Mark I reactors have, um, you know, there, there's a long legacy of problems there. So a group of citizens has petitioned the NRC to shut those down. I don't think the NRC will ever do that. Um, I think they may, over the next three or four years, insist on safety changes that will make some of those plants uneconomical. But the NRC will not say, this plant is unsafe. They'll say, this plant needs these modifications. And the owners will then say, we can't afford those modifications, and eventually, and In three to five years, I suspect some of these will be shut down, but not all of them. THX 1138. You also have something to say about what uh, the industry is uh, proclaiming to be the next sliced bread, the new reactor design basis of the AP-1000. Do you find anything wrong with that? Um, Well, it it dates back to Fukushima. I had some problems with the AP-1000 design before Fukushima. And it had to do with the containment. And I was told by the NRC in no uncertain terms there is zero probability that the containment will fail. And this was uh, last last summer. And of course, we had Fukushima where three containments failed in three days, and, uh, and yet the NRC still hasn't changed its mentality. For these new reactors, they're saying it's, it's zero probability that the containment will fail. Well, what happens on this, this new design is they've got an enormous water tower on the roof. They've got six million pounds of water up on the roof of this containment. And the theory is that after an accident, they can turn some valves on and sprinkle the water down over the containment to keep it cool. Well, Fukushima has what's called the loss of the ultimate heat sink. The, the, the ability to cool the plant failed. And the NRC is just now beginning to realize this, despite the fact that I said it on CNN back in March. And um, this loss of the ultimate heat sink applies to the AP-1000 design as well. I could come up with about half a dozen ways that that tank at the top could either fail or become plugged. And in either case, 
the ability of that tank to then cool the containment won't exist, and then we'll have a, a Fukushima type event with the AP1000. So I've asked the NRC um, as part of uh, something called the AP1000 Oversight Group, which is a group of uh, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations in the, in the southeast, um, to um, to hold up on licensing the AP1000 and, and spend the next half year trying to look at what happened to Fukushima and apply those lessons to the AP1000. The NRC doesn't seem to want to do that. They want to license this plant with loan guarantees and, and get a couple of them built, like, right now. And uh, we know from the WikiLeaks cables uh, that the State Department has uh, put full force behind um, strong-arming governments around the world to give favorable terms to the manufacturers of the AP-1000. So uh, it does appear to be as much a financial issue as it is one of rationality, safety, or efficiency. Our guest is Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates, and uh, this is really um, an enlightening encounter because we're getting to catch up on so many things that... uh, have been developing uh, beneath most public notice and uh, most commercial coverage. And uh, in the uh, three minutes or so that we have remaining, Arnie, I open the floor to you to uh, apprise our intelligent listeners as to how to be more aware or protect themselves against these hazards. Uh, um, well, I, I am advising our friends not to buy food from Japan, um, even if... Um, there's a claim that you know it's it's passed underneath the radiation detector and there's um, there's not much radioactivity. Uh, you know, I think for a year or two it's just a prudent thing to um, to do. Um, you know, on the East Coast, that's really about all we can we can do. There's going to be a little bit of cesium in all our foods. I mean, uh, my friend's garden showed up with a little bit of cesium. Um, it's everywhere and. Um, it's going to ultimately get in very low concentrations into our food. Not true in the Cascades. There's there's other things we should be doing there. But really, um, I, I think the key now, my, my biggest concern is what's coming in through the ocean. And your comment about, uh, about tuna is certainly appropriate. I think we really need to push the, um, um, the, the government to um, inspect the fish, especially these top-of-the-food-chain fish, which will accumulate um, cesium and strontium and things like that. Um, maybe not now, but certainly starting next year. You know, the salmon and the tuna and, and these um, large top-of-the-food-chain the uh, animals. Um, that's probably the most likely source for you and I on the East Coast to pick up a relatively high uh, concentration of, of radiation would be uh, starting about next year in the fish. The government doesn't want to do that. And they just, um, I think what's going to take is a, a, a shipload of tuna that sets off a radiation alarm in a port or something like that to get people's attention. But the right thing to do would be to monitor the fish and make sure that the concentrations are extraordinarily low. Arnie Goodison, um, thank you so much for being with us today on 5 o'clock Shadow. I uh, hasten to point out to our listeners that there's infinitely more detail and specificity and utility at the website, and it's spelled F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot com, fairwinds dot com. And uh, the website is a revelation, and um, it's maintained by um, reader support, much as we hear, or maintained by listener support. And uh, Fairwinds is a 501c3. It's a non-profit organization, and we certainly hope that our listeners will support your work at uh, the website. Well, well, thank you very much, and I'll keep you informed via emails on a daily basis about how it went. This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network. I'm Robert Knight in New York. You just heard a prescient interview with Arnie Goodison of Fairwinds Associates about the scale of the Fukushima disaster. Next, we consider the cynical cover-up of the Japanese government regarding Fukushima radiation hazards by way of this report from guest correspondent Ian Goddard, who exposes the cynical nature of Japan's recent reduction of exposure standards by a factor of 20.